be living in a concrete jungle. Philly, a human zoo. That's why we act like this. Yeah, it's a jungle out here. We animals doing what we want to out here. Out here yeah, out here. it's a jungle out here. You could get this some shit, be the stumble out here. Out here yeah, out here. it's a jungle out here. Get the gun to you before you get the rumble out here. Out here yeah, out here. it's a jungle out here. Better have you come with you, you ever come through out here. I eat whatever edible, but beef it was never you. Potato on the heat, then you go from vegan to vegetable. Your shit regimen, I only twist medical. I get some hot. You back, bro? Yeah, I'm back. So we so we on man. We ain't on live. We on video. Uh, shouts out to the real BRC. Shouts out to the goat. Shouts out to Goat Gang and any and everybody that appreciate this real shit, man. I got a special guest for y'all today, man. He needs no introduction. Go ahead, bro. Bang, bang, bang. Y'all know who it is when you hear that double bang. Goat Gang, man. We in there. Goat Gang, Goat Gang. Shouts out to the real Goat Gang. Shouts out to the real BRC. Thank you, Double R Retro Rob, for having me, man. It's always a pleasure to speak to you, my bro. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hey, bro, can you uh talk a little louder for me? Yes, sir. I got you. Okay, got there you. we go. There we go. That's yes, what I'm sir. talking about. All right. So, uh, today, first of all, salute to the GOAT for reaching 3 million views in this goods battle. Yes, um, sir. They doubted him and said, you know, he wasn't going to do this. He was going to be outdated, you know, yada, yada, yada. Anything you want to say about that, bro? I think everything pretty much speaks for itself, man. Hate him or love him, you gotta watch him. And that's what y'all doing. Y'all say he's trash, you say he's boring, but you just can't stop watching him and can't stop talking about him. The funny part is how y'all y'all try to judge and condemn, you know, a real BRC when we drop his name or when we do blogs about him, but y'all talk about him more than we do. Yes, indeed. There's a reason for that. So, you know, it's greatness, man. Brother is just great. He, he's great at what he does. My grandmother used to say, "Man, you worry, you worry when they stop talking about you." That's a fact. Yeah, my grandmother used to say, "If you don't care that Jimmy cracked corn, you wouldn't walk around singing a song about it." Oh man. Yeah. Yes, yeah. sir. So uh, we gonna kick this joint off, man. But yeah, salute to the goat, man, and salute to the real BRC, man. That's not only just a testament to the goat. Um, and his endurance and shit like that. But um, it's also a testament to the real BRC, man, because none of this would be possible if we didn't, you know, support the real, man. Right. You know, people will right. say uh, we didn't support Cassidy, but like you say, we do what, bro? What's, what, up, my bro? what's my saying? What's my saying that I like that you say? We don't support what? Oh, oh man, we, we don't support people. We support standards, man. We support principles. Yes, indeedy. So we, we back principles, not people, man. Yes, sir. So we're going to talk about, um, but I'm going to let Jersey kick it off. We're going to talk about Cassidy versus Arsenal in this upcoming battle, September the 21st. Um, who is going to win and why? Um, strengths and weaknesses. So go ahead, bro. Talk about it. You know, first and foremost, I just want to say one more time, man, thank you, Double R, for having me. I want to thank everybody who's, who's watching and listening right now. I love and appreciate all of y'all, from the supporters to those of you who, who watch and listen just to hate, just to come in the comments or, you know, because I'm sure, Double R, I'm sure you've seen the same exact type of deal where you upload a video and as soon as it's uploaded, you get a dislike. And that's somebody who didn't even hear what you have to say or anything. They just automatically come. But we appreciate those too. Because the YouTube algorithm, there's really no difference between likes and dislikes. There's no difference between positive comments and negative comments. They all go in the same bowl, baby. And it all it all chalks up to support. So, you know, thanks to, to the supporters and even thank you to the haters. And another thing I wanted to say is, with the Cassidy vs. Goods battle, people were accusing me of being biased toward Cassidy and, and going against Goods because, strictly because of Cassidy. And, you know, I, I've already kind of, I've dismantled that theory, man, because the way I feel about Goods as a battle rapper is the way I've always felt about Goods as a battle rapper. And that is 100% completely disconnected from anything that has to do with Cassidy. It is independent of Cassidy, the way I feel about Goods. With this Arsenal battle, you know, this is this only goes to strengthen my case because a lot of y'all know I'm from Jersey, and you know I love artists, man. I love the Jersey battle rappers. 
I love us. I think he's super dope. He did a whole lot for battle rap. He did a whole lot for New Jersey within battle rap. And he transcended battle rap to a certain extent. So, you know, I just love the way that brother moves. And I think he's very talented. And he most definitely left his fingerprint on the game. So, you know, uh, this is one of those deals where nobody can come into the comments anymore talking about, oh, you just hate me because, you know, uh, the dude is going against Cassidy, whatever. You can't do that with me with this battle because I'm a fan of Arsenal as well. So, you know, this is going to be way more what you may believe is way more objective, even though my commentary about Cassidy and Guts was objective to a degree. Uh, you know, this one is going to be, this is not me just being a fan of one and not like any other one. So there's that. But yeah, talking about impact, man, that, that's one of the things that inspired me to even start talking about Battle Rap was the fact that people weren't putting this man's name in his proper perspective. And they were kind of trying to rewrite history and saying that he, he was not impactful to the Battle Rap culture when this dude put Battle Rap on his back. Like he said it himself in his very first round. You may, I mean, he said, I made Battle Rap popular. You got popular with Battle, Battle Rap. Rap. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's 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 a fact, man. So I think that we can, uh, we can kind of break this down into two different categories when we're talking about, you know, impact and Cassidy's impact on Battle Rap and within Battle Rap. So uh, the two different categories would be what he did for Battle Rap that's one category, and the other one is within battle rap because they are two different things. So, uh, you know, once we once we kind of iron those things out and understand, I think that maybe people will get a little bit of a better understanding of the real BRC and where we stand on. We're saying that Cassidy did a whole lot for battle rap, and that cannot be taken away. They're, they're trying to take it away, but they can't do that. But the, the, so yeah, that's one category. What he did for battle rap is set in stone. You can't deny that. I think that their beef with a lot of people and what they're saying is they don't think that he did a lot within battle rap. So that's mm -hmm. a that's a different you know type of scenario because what he did for battle rap was put battle rap on the on the map in a mainstream type of way. But within battle rap, I can understand people having you know a little bit of a an argument you know as far as that goes. Seeing is how. He only did two battles within this newer culture of battle rap. So but can I say something real quick? Culture are different. Yes, sir. Uh, that don't to me that doesn't really matter. You see what I'm saying? Because right, right. What, he, what he's done, you know, I'm referring to what you were saying about what he's done within battle rap because we all we all see what all the other battlers have done within battle rap, and none of them has made the impact that Cassidy has made up until this Never. point. Go ahead, bro. Never. Yeah, but you know that their whole deal is how many times, if, if, if we had a nickel for every time we heard this type of phrase, then, you know, we would, me and you would be wealthy right now. <laughs> how many times have you heard them, them argue and say this, this phrase on cam, on, on camera, camera yeah. footage? Because their whole mentality is that with, with, Battles not being on camera with, with him running around and killing everything before our camera phones existed. Their whole thing is since we don't see it on camera, then it didn't really happen. And that's that's a flawed that's flawed logic right there. That doesn't make sense. But you know what though? To, you know sorry. what? They remind me they they remind me of the man. They remind me of the white man. You see what I'm saying? And okay. I'm gonna tell you why, okay. because you know there's a whole bunch of guys. Our brothers, in particular, that's behind bars. And the ones right. that got them behind bars are the original criminals, the original crooks. You see what I'm right. saying? And I'm right. saying that to connect with the fact of these battlers where they say all these things about Cassidy and what Cassidy ain't do and what Cassidy should have done, but they don't use that same thing and um, hold their sales and their favorite battlers accountable as they do with Cassidy. You see what I'm saying? Of course not, and they're not going to, because it's not, see the difference is, with them, they're, they're moving and speaking and thinking and talking emotionally, mm -hmm. it's not logical, you know, emotion is the total opposite, it's the polar opposite of logic, which is a, a major difference between males and females, and why males were created to be leaders, yeah. leaders of the household, leaders of government, things like that, Real talk. and uh, it's because women move off of emotion. So mm -hmm. males, we are not supposed to move off of emotion. 
it's just a funny generation. It's a funny era where a lot of males have very, very female feminine tendencies these days. So a lot of males do the, the same things that females do, and they move off of emotion. Now, that's not to say that as males, as men, we shouldn't have emotions, because we all do. Of course we all have emotions. Some of them are heightened, even. Uh, you know, anger, sadness. We have emotions, but as males, we were not designed to move off of emotion. When you move off of emotion, you get yourself in trouble. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's what a lot of these guys are doing. And uh, I shared that, I did a video in the middle of the week, I forget which one it was and what it was called. Um, oh, I think it was the history of Cassidy Joint. And what they what they have done with us, and I, like I said, man, we've been rocking together, so I know you've seen this, I know you've seen it. What they try to say about us is that we're only saying that Cassidy is dope. We're only saying that he impacted the game because we like him. Hey, 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 Jersey, hey, Jersey. I don't give yeah. a fuck what they say. And I'm going to tell you why I don't. At the uh -huh. end of the day, and I know you've seen this, before Cassidy, the talks about Cassidy even exist, you know, they have all they always have their biasness towards their favorite battles. Nobody could tell anybody about Tay Rock losing. Nobody could tell anybody about K-Shine losing. Nobody could tell anybody about DNA and all the rest of these clowns. You see what I'm saying? Right, Nobody right. could tell you anybody about smack being a fucking culture vulture you know you say that right. and we're hating and we don't want to see another brother shine you see what i'm saying right and this but is you know why I, oh, i'm sorry go ahead my brother. and this is and this shit is clearly going on this shit is clearly going on the shit that they saying about cassidy that's the difference between us and them if anybody want to know we're the real brc for a reason and they are the brc for a reason because we speak nothing but the truth nothing but right. the real they speak nothing but fabricated bullshit and push bullshit ass narratives and lies. Right. You see what I'm saying? Right. They're saying all this shit about Cassidy, which is lies. We're saying everything about Smack and those battlers. It is nothing but the fucking truth. Go ahead, bro. Right. But, you, you know, you have to understand where it comes from. Again, it's, it's coming from an emotional place. And the reason why a lot right. of these brothers get so emotional about it, whether it's the battle rappers that that have come across our channels and, and don't like what we say, whether it's the league owners smacking them, Norbs and Chico and, and Beasley and them, or whether it's the battle rap bloggers, the big time battle rap bloggers. I'm not concerned with the with the small potatoes, but the big time battle rap bloggers. The reason why, it, it's not logical for them to be fighting against us so hard. Mm -hmm. and considering what we're fighting for, we're fighting for lyricism, being back into the driver's seat of battle rap. Logically speaking, there should be no debate, there should be no argument, there should be no pushback. But they're pushing back because they like all this extra stuff. And, and again, we always have to kind of hold their hand and walk them through exactly what we're saying and what mm -hmm. we mean. We're not saying that there's no place for performance or, you know, doing the dances on stage or, or what they call crowd control and all that. We're not saying that that stuff isn't important or it isn't dope or you don't have to have that. That's never been our argument. Our argument has always simply been that lyricism has to, to be at the forefront. That should be primary. Mm -hmm. But they're fighting against that. And the reason is, the reason why they're fighting so hard is because... Look, they don't look, have it. They, they found something that they could win at. You got to mm -hmm. realize, a lot of these brothers, man, especially when, when this battle rap format initially started, these weren't people who woke up and, and one day and just had aspirations of being battle rappers. Battle rap was a subcategory of hip hop, where battle rap was something you had to do to show and prove that you were nice, so you could get a record deal and put your, your family and your people on. That's what it was all about. The people who became battle rappers were people who were basically industry rejects. There were people who were trying to get into the industry and it didn't work. Smack saw that uh, that it could be profitable, it could be marketable. But I want to ask you this question though. Yeah. Why did Smack seem that it could be profitable? I want to know if you know the same, if you looking where I'm looking. Well, you know, Smack, Smack was, Smack was really nothing more than an instigator, of being honest. Back in the Smack DVD days. But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you why before you go into that. I'm going to tell you why. Because of Cassidy. Oh, of course, of course. Of course he was at the forefront of that. That's a fact. That's a Snapple fact, man. Yeah, Smack was nothing more than an instigator. Smack used to follow people around. He was like a male Wendy Williams. He used to, he used to, because you know, he's from New York or whatever. He used to find 
and seek out industry rappers, industry artists. It was beefs. He was covering beefs. Right. And and not just covering beefs. That that wasn't even my beef with Smack, honestly. It wasn't that he was just covering beefs because beef beef has been part of hip hop almost from the beginning. The, what I didn't like about what Smack was doing with the Smack DVDs was that he was fostering beefs. Just covering something is one thing, but he was he was seeking it out and he was fostering these beefs. He would he would run into these established artists and he would be bringing up if they had beef with another you know label or something like that. He would bring it up and that's all he wanted to talk about. Bro, whenever whatever, bro. Uh, whatever rapper that they were talking about, Snack would go find that dude and show him the footage. Oh, he just said this and he's fostering those beats. Hey Jersey, the, yeah, I want to make something real clear before you go into what you're about to say. And you made a great point. You made a magnificent point. Smack, everybody keep talking about we want to bring another brother down and we don't want to see another brother shine. But this this brother right here, and I'm referring to Smack, you see what I'm saying? He's the one that don't want to see other brother shine. And people say, well, why is he putting all these dudes on? First of all, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. The battlers put themselves on Smack just yeah. had the platform and he had the platform because he had the product which was the battlers now moving forward you just made a great point about uh smack and the beefs so and my issue my biggest issue with smack is not only him fostering the beefs and shit like that but who's who's beefing you see what i'm saying right the fuck us blacks so if he can, if he started his, cause remember I told you, if you was a crook, if you remember one of my old episodes, I said, if you was a crook back then, chances are, now people can change, but if you was a crook back then, chances are you a crook now. If you was a pedophile back then, chances are you a pedophile now. If you was a snake back then, chances are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that be, that be him um, commenting. Oh, I don't even know if he's, I know he ain't allowed to blog, so uh, I'm not sure if, he's, if, if he has like an, an alias account or anything. I was just saying, for those who don't know who Chris Unbias is, um, and, and if you've ever either followed me or seen any of my history of battle rap blogging videos, Chris Unbias is one of the original battle rap bloggers that blew up. He's one of the first. He's part of that, that first wave of battle rap bloggers who were just really, they were nothing more than battle rap fans and they blogged about it and you know, they, they started gaining a following because prior to those guys, battle rap blogging didn't exist, it wasn't really a thing. But uh, Chris Unbias was one of the first ones who really blew up off the battle rap blog. But uh, yeah, so a couple years ago, he ended up getting arrested and he got arrested for, uh, for allegedly, for sexual assault and he, he, he allegedly robbed and beat up this, this girl he had sex with or whatever, uh, raped her, and, then, and let me keep saying allegedly. And then another one was, I think, like an eight or nine or ten-year-old boy who he sodomized, and, you know, it was a lot of cases like that, so he ended up getting locked up for that. But, uh, yeah, so he's out right now, but he's out on bail. He finally got a bond after two years, so he's going through his trial now. But uh, and, and they also found a bunch of stuff on his computer as far as uh, child pornography and things like that. So I'm not even sure if he's, he's legally allowed as part of his bond to be, you know, online and, and dropping videos and everything. Because that was honestly one of the first things I expected was for him to hop back on his channel and, you know, kind of let the people know what was going on and everything. Because he was a big name in this battle rap blogging culture. Most definitely. Uh, most de notice, um, we, we always have, and not all of them, but a lot of them these dudes that do blogging, battle rappers, man, um, as we've seen, uh, I guess it's safe to say that now, but I'll just say allegedly with, you know, the late great Tech 9 You see what I'm saying? Right. So I'll just say allegedly because I don't know if it's safe to say that he actually did it now. Right, but even right. Though it's, even though it's record out there. Right, right. Um, and we, we see that a lot of those dudes, man, they're weird. They're strange characters. You know, they... Yep. They, they put their hands on women and, you know, all this stuff going on. And then they out here acting like they some stand-up guys. But then you right. turn around and you hear all this crap about them. Right. My but, thing is, man, it, it may be some more of them floating around. Who knows? Because nobody expected that, at least for Tech 9. But Chris Unbiased, man, we, we knew what it was for him. And it's funny, man. It's funny because, 
No, we, we've been saying that for years and years and years. As a matter of fact, when the news came out and they were saying that that because somebody has got arrested for uh, for alleged sexual assault, sodomy, and all of that. Yeah. It was there were people who were like ticked off at me because he has his fan base and all that. There were people ticked off at me because I said, yo, I didn't know it's a female because they were talking like, yeah, he allegedly raped and sodomized a female and this and that. And I said, yo, how do you know it's a female? Just because with, with Chris Unbiased, man, that was always on my radar. Something was off about that, brother. Mm-hmm. Something was always off about it. But when you spoke about it publicly back then, you know, people called you all kind of haters and everything. And then sure enough, it came out maybe a week later that it was a, a, a boy involved. Not even a, a, not even a man, not even a grown male. We're talking about an eight, nine, ten year old kid. And that's sad, man. That's sad. I always felt like, and, and I stick to this too, I stand on it. Rapists, pedophiles, I believe they deserve the death penalty, man. They shouldn't be sitting up in nobody's jail, period. Mm-hmm. Once they are, are convicted and found to be most definitely guilty, they deserve to, to die. That, that offense should be punishable by death. And people say that I'm hard. First of all, I say that they should be castrated first. Castrated and then killed. And then, you know, some people say, oh, that's harsh. Why castrate and kill them? Nah, because what you have to understand, the castration, of course, is part of the penalty. But... They gotta go, man. They should be, they should be killed because of the fact that that's exactly what they did to, to another individual. That's the problem with, with rape and pedophilia, molestation, things like that. You killed, them. you took a life basically because whoever you did that to, their lives will never be the same ever, ever. From the time that they die, from the time that it happens to the time that they die, they will never be the same in the head, man. And they even if, and even if they don't die, they'll never be the same. Right, right. Never. They will never be the same again. They'll never have, they'll never be able to have healthy relationships. Uh, they'll never be able to, to fully trust or, or anything like that. Their lives are done. You're, you're causing an avalanche of issues by your one greedy sexual act, man, for, for your sexual gratification. And I think that that's despicable. And I'm speaking on behalf of, you know, the people who, who had to go through that because I've seen the effects of it. You know what I'm saying? And that's not a small deal. It's not a small deal at all. You technically took a life, basically. Mm-hmm. But I want to go back. I want to go back, uh, rewind back to what you was just saying, because you was making, you was getting somewhere with that about okay. Smack Foster and these beefs and stuff like that. Okay. Because okay. I wanna, I wanna make a correlation between what Smack was then and how he made himself now. You know, I don't see. I'm just saying, I don't see too much change in in Smack. You know what I'm saying? Because if you foster beefs and you instigated beefs, and ironically now, you're the fucking so-called founder of Battle Rap, which is like a form of um, verbal fighting. You see what I'm saying? Right, right. Verbal, yeah, verbal uh, interacting off, you know, negative. You know, and you made your career off of that, off of beefing. How the fuck... And that's telling me one thing, that you're willing to do anything to make a dollar, even if it comes at the expense of your own people. Right. And, and I was just about to say, my problem with, with what Smack was doing with his DVDs initially, my problem isn't inherently that that he was quote-unquote fostering his beeps, because if it was rap beef, if it was a situation where, you know, two established artists were going back and forth on wax, and we got a bunch of dope diss tracks out of it and it was just music, that's one thing. <laughs> I wouldn't even have minded him doing that, you know, because that type of competition, that that is, that is hip hop. That's been part of hip hop from the beginning. Mm-hmm. So if that was the extent of it, that wouldn't be an issue. My problem with, with what Smack was doing was with a lot of those beats that he was fostering, it was past rap. We're not mm-hmm. talking about brothers who were making some diss songs or nothing like that. We're talking about brothers who were saying on site, it was a problem. And they were getting in front of Smack's camera talking about, you know, what they were going to do to the other person when they saw him or I'm going to harm your family and things like that. Just look at the old Smack DVD footage. And he was fostering that for his own game, for a profit. And, you know, so one rapper would say, yeah, when I see you, when I catch you, I'm going to do such and such. And Smack would go find that other rapper and then he would show them that footage. Yo, did you see what such and such said about you? What you think about that? Then the other one would get on the camera and do that. So, uh, you know, that's what it was. If it was just simply music, that was, it's nothing wrong with that, man, because it's competition. But, and but Jersey, I want to ask you something. Does that sound like a man? Because I want to, I want to, uh, 
shut this this notion down to all these fucking sheep, these uh, battle rap uh, community sheep. Um, so does that look like a man to you that's all about uh, brothers uh, doing well? Not at all. That's that's a man who's using people for his own gain. Mm-hmm. Regardless and despite what the consequences are and could be. Simple as that. Because it's sold DVDs. Because we as people, not, and it's not just us, so I never want to make it seem like it's just black folks. It's people, period. Mm-hmm. But we just, we are the, a, a people who don't have the luxury to be doing that. Because we actually, we follow through with a lot of the things that we say and talk about. And I hate the fact that we always have to be the fucking poster boy or poster girl for, you know, fuckery. You know, look at football. You know, you got the first, I don't know if you uh, heard about it because I know you you deep in the football, man. But uh, the first black male cheerleaders is, is, is with the Dallas Cowboys. You see what I'm saying? Right. Like, why we always got to be the, the, you see what I'm saying, with the com- comedians wearing dresses? Why we right. always got to be... The fucking butt right. of the fucking joke. Well, I mean, that's because the position that we're in as a people, that wasn't an accident. It was it was very meticulously put together and Most strategized definitely. that way. Most if definitely. you read uh, Willie Lynch's letters to the American slave owners, for those who don't know who Willie Lynch is, when you hear about a lynch mob or you hear about a lynching, that's the, what that, yeah, the Willie that's Lynch what that name came from, right? Willie Lynch was, uh, uh, he sold slaves and he owned slaves. And he was very good at controlling them, and he, he lived in the Caribbean, and he had good control of the slaves. So uh, the American slave owners, there was a period where a lot of the slaves, there were a bunch of uprisings where slaves were rising up against, you know, the people who quote-unquote owned them. So they were, there were a lot of uprisings, so then there were a lot of, of slave murders. So they contacted Willie Lynch, and they were asking him for his help in controlling their slaves. So he ended up coming to the states, and I believe it was Virginia he came to, and he, he wrote a letter, and he also, he used to do like uh, speeches and whatnot. So one of the first things he was saying when he got here was, on my way here, I've noticed that uh, they called us strange fruits. So whenever they would hang uh, black people from trees, they called it strange fruit. So anytime you hear strange fruit, that's, that means black people were hanging from trees like fruit. But uh, he was saying when he got there, one of the first things he said addressing the people was, I noticed on my way here how many how many black people you had hanging from trees. And the slave owners were like, they started applauding and cheering and, and, and like it was a good thing. Like they were impressing him with that. And what he said was, he said, no, that's that's very, very stupid. You're, you're, and and the, the guys you were hanging, the men and women you were hanging, it's not like they were even old slaves. These are young, strong slaves. So basically what you just did was you killed your income. So he said, um, mm. you don't want to kill them. You paid for these people. You want to be able to get the most out of them. So he, he addressed them and he wrote a letter telling them how to, to you know, control the slaves the best, which was you turn the men against the women, you turn the old against the young, you turn the parents against the children, you turn the light skin versus the dark skin. You, you make them, you control the infighting. And uh, so I'm not going to go through the whole letter, but I I suggest that everybody go read it. Yeah, yeah. Also, too, I want to elaborate on that, too. Um, And also about that, he had this thing called bucking. You see what I'm saying? He had this thing where as though uh, he take the toughest motherfucker out of the group and he make an example out of him. That way, nobody else will feel froggy or want to leap. You see what I'm saying? You You take the biggest, strongest, most headstrong one, the one who's the leader, and you break him in front of everybody. Mm-hmm. And then everybody else will fall in line because if that happens to the strongest of us, right. So yeah, I suggest that everybody, you know, go and read that letter because one of, the interesting, one of the most interesting uh, aspects of that letter was the time frame he was talking about. Where he said, if you do this effectively, this will last for generations. And the amount of years that he said it would last, we can look around right now and we can see that he, will, he knew what he was talking about. But he was saying four or five hundred years this will last. And we're still seeing the effects of that now. To this very day, how sad is it? It's 2019. We still have dark skin versus light skin wars. We still have old school versus new school. We still have our men against our women. Our men and our women, it's like we hate each other. Our I was just about to say that, though. Um, black women is all loud. It, it, it's just, it's I was just about to say that. that. He, they t- I call it they took the yoke of iron off our neck. Now they don't have to you know, uh, enslave us physically, although it's, it's back on um, once you go to jail. 
but right. they don't have to enslave us physically because right. psychologically we're already fucked. Look at the fucking markets and shit like that. It's how fructose right. corn syrup and every fucking thing. That's a fact. I'm teaching myself shit now that all the fucking traps that I was falling for, like it literally shows you that it's it's tra you ain't gonna escape what's going on. Like even the fruits and the vegetables and shit got uh all type of uh preservatives and shit in yeah. it. Yeah. So you ain't it's escaping funny. nothing. You just gotta make the best out of your situation. That's a fact. And it's funny you said that because I was just about to go there as well as far as the prison system. When slavery ended, you know, there was a whole group of people, and they were actually the Democrats, for those who don't know, who, who talk about that whole, oh, if you vote Republican, or if you're not a Democrat, you're this and that. It was the Democrats who fought to keep slavery. And I always ask people whenever we talk politics, and they start talking about Democrat versus Republican, uh, when did the party switch? When did, when did the Democrats switch and start liking and wanting to take care of black people? let me know that and then we can continue this conversation i'm not with none of these parties none of them care about us whatever but uh the republicans are half right and half wrong the democrats are half wrong and half right but yeah so what i wanted to say was um after after the war was won and slavery technically ended the slave owners and the people who were profiting the most off of it they were pissed off of course so they had to come up with a plan b so like you just brought up which is why I said it's funny that you mentioned it. With the prison system, right after slavery ended, they figured out a way to keep slavery. So what they did was they passed legislation because prior to slavery ending, the, uh, any prisoner for any crime or whatever, he still had the same basic human rights as a free man does. But after slavery, what ended up happening was they passed legislation to, to take away the rights of people who were, you know, criminals or, or, or in prison. So they could they could get free labor basically. Very, very cheap. To this day it's twenty nineteen and brothers get paid, you know, a dollar thirty a week for working 10, 12 hours a day. That's slavery. That's mm -hmm. that's enslavement. So yes, they did they pass legislation to take away the rights of prisoners to, to make it basically where prisoners were legal slaves. And after they did that they, they overly criminalized a whole bunch of different behaviors. So what they would do is, since they could no longer just uh, take and, and snatch black folks and put them on plantation, they would just, they used the cops. They became officers and joined the police force and they would charge these people with crimes that they were innocent of. Then they would throw the book at them and now they're, you know, they're considered criminals and now they're right back into slavery. Now they can go and build roads and make license plates and all that type of stuff for free. So. Prison system is actually current slavery. Yes, and sir. It's still like that to this day. Okay, that's that's deep, man. Uh, also, also too, I want to go back to what we were just saying about smack and shit. Okay. Um, because I want to, I want these people to know this, man. You know, I know my people know this, but specifically, you know, our people know this, but specifically, I want you know people that don't know it, new subscribers and motherfuckers on that other side that want to talk this and that, even though we know they got a hidden agenda of their own. You see what I'm saying? Um, so Smack, I want to talk about Smack and these fucking events. How he takes uh, hours to start the fucking events. Then he takes about 45 minutes in between each fucking battle. Motherfuckers are tired. Motherfuckers are, uh, you know, drunk, high. You see what I'm saying? Right. People want to blame it on, well, you know, you don't want to go last because... You know, if you go last, man, fuck that. At the end of the day, y'all need, people need to stop worrying about what the fuck, you know, uh, irrelevant shit. And start worrying about what you need to be worried about. And that's this motherfucker getting y'all money and he not right. giving y'all great accommodation and great service. Right. Well, this is the thing, man. They've been throwing these battles for long enough at this point to where I think those type of kinks should be worked out already. No bullshit. Now, granted, when no the URL initially started, they weren't. They weren't throwing events of this magnitude at all. They were literally battling on the streets, or there were some battles that happened in barber shops or sneaker stores and things like that. So they didn't have to worry about trying to book a venue. It was basically, look, man, wherever we can fit this this hundred people at or whatever. But battle rap grew to the point where they had to start renting venues. Mm. So initially, when it when it first got that big, I could understand. I can understand there being hiccups and some confusion with trying to control. When you're talking about thousands and thousands of people, especially black folks, especially young black folks, because it ain't no old heads up in the defense. 
but especially with young black folks, it is it is kind of difficult to you know uh, to make sure everybody's control to control everybody. And you know you already know Smack and Visa and them cheap, so you know they're not they're not breaking the bank for security. They're gonna have just enough. So it's gonna be difficult to control people when you look at a lot of the events. Uh, when when you buy the pay per view, you see it a little bit differently. So if you're just watching it on on uh, URL on YouTube. You don't really see what goes on between rounds. But, hey, bro, you just made a point. Battles. Not to cut you off, but you just made yeah. a point. They're not willing. The light went off. You just said that they're not willing to break the bank for security. Like, you see this in jobs and shit like that where you clearly know that, the, you know, you've went, been in uh, retail stores, all of that shit, the way you right. clearly can see that these motherfuckers need help. And yeah. you may need a job. And you ask yeah. them for a job, and they be like, we're not hiring. How the right. fuck you not hiring? And you got a whole motherfucking line wrapped around the corner. Right. You well, need fucking help. Look at, but yeah, I want to say this. I wanted to say this, though, bro. Oh, With, and I want you to touch on it real quick. About uh, about the security. What you just said about the security and how oh. Smack and all them um, are cheap and they don't want to pay for the security. They don't. They want to pocket all the fucking money. Of Talk about that. That's, well, that's the name of the game, and that's exactly what I was just about to talk about, is what you have to realize from, from their perspectives when you're talking about Smack, Beasley, Chico, Norms, Twiz, and all of them, this is their business. This is not just their business either. It's not a hobby. This is their livelihood. This is how they pay their bills. So any businessman knows the name of the game is buy low, sell high, you know, keep your expenses to a minimum, keep your overhead to a minimum, and you want to be able to rake in as much as you possibly can to capitalize so when they're looking, when they're throwing these events and they're going to these venues, they see the size of it. They know how many people are going to be there. When it comes down to having to talk about security, they're not looking at it from, from the protection aspect of it. When they're talking about security, they're not looking at it from the security aspect. They're looking at it as just an expense. So their whole thing is going to be the safety is not primary. Order is not primary. Primary is cost. But you know what, though? You know what? Yeah. Beasley, I heard Beasley say something, and I knew it's funny how we be thinking, bro. I be, I be knowing these motherfuckers going to say it before they even say it. But I was thinking about this, uh, you know, when they came out with the app and shit like that. And I was okay. thinking about I was thinking about this right after. You know I made a video about uh, smacking the URL versus Vince McMahon and the WWE app. Right, right, right. And I was saying, you said smacking them have been around since 09. They have been around since 09. This is like, they like a decade in. There's no fucking reason you should be talking about, oh, we still got to grow. We still got to do this and do that. Fucking Vince McMahon and them, they give you, everything is organized, is what I'm trying to say. Smacking them should not, you was right, smacking them should not be this dysfunctional and organized, whether it's with black motherfuckers, urban community, or not. They should be fucking organized enough, but the problem is, is that they're not trying to spend money where it needs to be spent. And they're trying to keep all the money. That's including the money from the actual battlers. The motherfuckers that's making them the money. So all these motherfuckers that's out here talking about, uh, we don't want to see another brother shine and all this, here's your fucking answer. But go ahead, bro. Touch on that. Yeah, nah, so I mean, that's that's basically the long and short of it, my bro. It's, it's, about, it's all about the Benjamin. They don't, they're not concerned with the safety. When you when you buy the events on pay-per-view and you actually see like the whole deal, you see you see what happens before the battle. You see them coming to the stage and everything. They have problems with the, the, the people on the stage. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Where after the battle is over, they'll tell them, all right, look, man, y'all got to get off now and then the next group come up. And those people just straight up don't, don't even listen to them. Same thing during the battles where there are battles where there's sometimes a ruckus may break out a little bit. And they'll be trying to tell all, all the people on the stage, all right, y'all got to back up. They don't even move. They don't listen at all. But I'm going to ask you this. Do you think the people that's on the stage should just be, I think they should just be in the front row. They should have first priority in the front row. I don't think nobody should be on stage but the battlers. Well, if nobody's on stage but the battlers, they can't sell stage passes for a couple hundred hours. That's the way you got to look at it, too. Capitalization. Yeah. Capitalization. They need right. to cut that shit out, man. They charge people for, for you know, at, at each event, you can pay the money to be on stage. But, you know, you're not paying, the money that you pay to be on stage is not the same amount as it is in the front row. So you're saying, you're saying the fact that they aren't organized 
is because of their fucking greed. That's absolutely, that's all it is, man, is their greed. Because there's no excuse at this point, man. I, I told y'all a little while ago, I used to throw parties in college, and it started off as just house parties. But then my junior year, a big, a, a whole big deal happened on LaSalle's campus. They ended up calling it the LaSalle riots that me and a couple of my uh, football teammates were in the middle of. Nobody swung in, no cops, nothing like that. It was just homecoming, so they broke up all the house parties. And uh, so there were hundreds and hundreds of kids drunk and high and all of that outside of the dorms at 1.30 in the morning. Two white boys ended up fighting over a, a girl. So all the cops that were going around breaking up the parties, they all flew to the dorms. They shut the block down. They brought out paddy wagons and everything, and they were trying to clear the block. And, you know, it ended up popping off where somebody didn't obey an order the way that they wanted him to. Mm. He wasn't moving fast enough, so they started beating him, and they missed folks. But anyways, after that, the campus, uh, the, the campus got sued because of what the cops did. Mm. So, and everything was on camera, but they hid the cameras. Anyways, long story, a little less long. What ended up happening was, after that event, because it was such a liability, they started shutting down all of the house parties. And LaSalle Security wasn't able to do that. I had an off-campus house. They couldn't come to my house and shut anything down. They didn't have authority because it wasn't on campus. But what they started doing was, they would follow, whenever they saw a bunch of students going to a house, they would follow them, figure out what house it was, then they would call the police. And, you know, the Philadelphia Police Department would come and shut down all the parties. But I made good money throwing parties, so what I did was, instead of just giving up since I can't throw house parties, I started throwing what's called bus parties. I would rent the hall, then I would call a school bus company, and I would, I would rent three or four big school buses and have them shuttling to all of the dorms, picking kids up at the dorms, taking them to the hall, and back and forth all night long. So, you know, they had to drive drunk. And I was making good money with those, but the very mm -hmm. first time I threw one, I lost a lot of money because I ended up, uh, I sold tickets. And, you know, if you bought the tickets before, yeah, you get ready, for man. 10. You, you can get the tickets for ten dollars if you bought it for forty, the actual part. But if you try to pay at the door, it's twenty dollars. So what I did was I just designed the tickets and I printed them out on the printer. But what ended up happening was I was stupid. So somebody, all they did was they they scanned it and they ended up just printing their own tickets. So I lost a lot of money with that. Then there were a lot of things inside the venue that I did wrong. So the next time I threw a party, I did it different. I went online and I bought these. Uh, plastic wristbands like you get at a club and I got them personalized so nobody could go and just make any of those joints. It was uh, custom. So, you know, I just said all that to say I learned and I evolved. So each time the parties got better and I made more money, I was able to capitalize more and things like that. So URL is far enough along where these problems that they're having, they shouldn't be having anymore. But do you know how much more money it cost me to, to go and order and print wristbands than it did for me to just, you know, design it myself and then print it out on a printer and cut them out. I had to spend more money for those wristbands, but you know what? I ended up making more money and the experience was better. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, you, you spend a little more money up front, but everything goes a lot more smooth. Same deal with inside. There are certain things on the inside I had to change. I had to get security. When you're talking so I want to ask you this. Kids, I want to ask you this, bro. Mm -hmm. So... We, it's already safe to say, pretty much safe to say to say, um, smack in the URL, um, greed is actually ironically preventing them from making more money. And I want to ask you another thing too. Where do you yeah. think the money is actually going? Man, it's going into their pockets. So, so they have enough money, and they can be making enough money if they pay for security and and fix the little things. You see what I'm saying? They can have enough money to be able to make more money so that they can build their uh, brand up some more. Right. But they're spending their, they're spending that money on themselves and their lifestyles. Absolutely. Man, you remember what I was saying about Summer Madness 2 and how Mook, uh, how Mook changed the game in the eyes of the actual battle rappers themselves? Yeah, the 20, the 20 raps. People come in my comments all the time and they say things and they really don't know. Mm -hmm. They argue with me about things that they actually are not knowledgeable about. So they'll say, oh yeah, it was a dope blog, but you got this you got this wrong as far as the finances. Prior to Summer Madness 2, the battle rappers were not making that much money, man. There were a lot of battle rappers who they weren't paying them at all. Then there were other battle rappers where they, if they had to travel, they'll, they'll pay for the flight, they'll pay for, they'll pay for the hotel room, but they weren't paying them a lot of money. 
when Mook said that he got 20,000, that a light went off to the other battle rappers because when they were negotiating prior to that, they would be asking for certain amounts of money and the URL would say, oh, we don't got it. But nobody knew what the URL was bringing in for these events and everything. Nobody knew how much money they were really playing with. But when, uh, so when Mook said that he got 20, Jones got 10, Ness got 10, uh, Solomon got 10, and who else? Somebody else. But when he said that, the other battle rappers, their ears went up like, wait, what? Who got 20? And then there's, there's four or five other cats that got 10. So I'm, I'm asking for five stacks, and they're telling me that they can't afford it. They lied. So that kind of, that raised everybody else's stock. So because those battlers uh, that got that, the 20 and 10, they were the, the, the classic dudes. They were the originals, the OGs. Smack and Beasley and them, it was supposed to be just one off. They were not paying them money. They weren't in MOOC. Mm. And to, so they could be back on the battle rap roster. That was supposed to be a one time deal. And Smack and Beasley and them's plan was for all of the young dudes, the young, the young guys that was on top, the Hitman Hollis, DNAs, and all of them. He thought that they were just going to run through Lux and all of them. And so I have another said, question for you. Yeah. And I don't, because cause I want to see. If if we uh, indeed think alike, I'm gonna do this a lot too, um, as we do videos in the future, um, to confirm. Because there's a lot of people that always wanted to see me and you do videos because they appreciate the fact of our knowledge and our wisdom and shit like that. So I want to ask you this: Why? And I already know the answer to this, but I want to know. I want to know uh, if you know this, uh, see the same way I do. You see what I'm saying? Why are people that aren't receiving a dime from smacking the URL and none of these other battle leagues um, taking up and defending these people and going against the people that's actually trying to help them so they won't be spending so much fucking money. Because change is scary. You gotta understand, especially with this genre, we're talking about an entire group of people, not just the battlers themselves, not just the league owners, but as far as the bloggers and even a lot of the fans. They had gone other places and tried to eat. They just couldn't do it. They wanted to be in the industry. Smack wanted to be. What Smack is doing now is Battle League. If he had it his way, you know those Smack DVDs we were just talking about? With yeah. the famous battle rap, I mean, with the famous rappers that he had talking crazy about each other? Yeah. If he had it his way, those would have been the dudes that he had battling one another. He would have loved to be recording them mm. because that would have been much more money. But you know they they wasn't with that, so they didn't they didn't want to do it. They weren't hopping in any ring. And uh, when Jay Mills was on was on uh, making the band, when Diddy brought him up there, making the band was a huge show at the time. It came on prime time on MTV MTV One, not even MTV Two. So now Jay Mills is a national name. So mm. battling battling wasn't new. Mook and Rex and all of them, Lux, all of them were running around Harlem at the same exact time trying to get on and trying to get deals. So when Jay Mills is on TV and with a Diddy co-sign, Jay Mills is now national. So then that uh, Mook and Jay Mills battle happened because that's like a back home beat. Smack was fortunate enough to, to hear about it before it happened and he brought the camera there. Then he put that battle at the end of one of the Smack DVDs and it blew up. Everybody loved it. So that's when the light went off. Like, okay, this is profitable. I can make money, mm. off, of, I can make money off of no names. Because initially, again, he wanted the names, and that's when he, he even tried to go back to, you know, getting getting people who had deals on Smack DVD to battle. That's when he was promoting that whole when Mook was coming at Cass. All of that was on Smack DVD. Smack is standing in front of Mook. This is after the Mook versus Jay Mills battle, and Mook is calling Cassidy out. Uh, and Cass said, "Man, I want a hundred And everybody laughed at him, like, "Man, you ain't never gonna get no hundred thousand for no." So Cassidy was was the first one that was on some yo this battle stuff. I'm not doing it for free no more. You gotta pay me, and this is what you gotta pay. Because prior to that, the way it worked was it wasn't like a third party came in to host the battle and paid both the battlers and. What it was was, your man from your hood is super nice. He's the nicest where y'all from. This is my guy. He's the nicest where I'm from. Kind of like what, what Kimbo Slice was doing before he went to MMA. Yeah, this dude, my dude from my hood is super nice. Nobody can beat him. And then they would get somebody else. And, and those two camps would put money up and bet who would win the fight or win the battle. And then the winner would get the whole pot. You know what I'm saying? That's how it was prior to that. But, uh... 
you know, so it wasn't, the format was not for a third party, like, like a battle league to come and pay everybody. That came later once everybody saw how profitable battle rap really, really was. Mm -hmm. So Luke is calling Cassidy out. Cassidy's saying, man, for 100000 I'll kill any of y'all. But for less than that, now I'm not doing it. And especially that was when Cass was, was lit in his career. So he is traveling, doing shows and all of that. He's on the radio every other spin. So less than 100000 he's like, yeah, I'm not doing it. So, so, so I already know the answer to this, right? I want to ask you, though. I already know the answer. Is it safe to say that Cassidy was actually indeed... the Well, Cassidy was the, actually the first motherfucker to do a lot of shit. But yeah. is it actually safe to say that Cassidy was the first person to know his, his worth as a battler? I'm not going to say he's the first to know his worth. He's the first to stand on that, though. Because That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because there are a lot of other battle rappers who... Even to this day, man, they know battle rap is profitable and all of that, and they still taking pennies on the dollar. Mm. And, and so they, they know that they make you worth something, but the way they're looking at it is, well, man, something is better than nothing. And and that's how you know when we dealing with, you know how Goods was trying to come and cast it, but the whole, oh, you only battling because you need the money. That's how you know who's battling because they need the money. When somebody is worth more and they're accepting less, and, and continue to do so on more than one occasion. That's somebody who needs the money. Cass said I want a hundred, and he didn't get a hundred. So you know what he did? He didn't battle. Exactly. <laughs> so they got that bread up. These other brothers, so they may they may be able to make demands like that because they they, they feel like their value was up there. But are they going to stand on? It? But you know what? Because it's so funny, right? That they don't want man. And like I said, man, they don't want people are afraid. You just said it. People are afraid. Are not only afraid of change. But they afraid to take L's and they afraid to say that they made a misjudgment. You see what I'm saying? Right. But the thing oh, is, right, right, Cassidy, uh, what I was about to say, Cassidy uh, stood on his, stood his, stood his pivot, stood his ground, and these motherfuckers is sitting up here glorifying Mook like he was the first person to do all this shit and glorifying Mook like he was the first person to stand on his ground. But don't even know that Mook got that shit from Cassidy. Right. Well, you know, a lot of these people, man, with the younger ones, I, I kind of don't waste a lot of my time on yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't they know. Really, they, they just don't know. They don't and, know. And they're not, they not the type of people, man. They're not cut from But see, this is what I told Phone Jones. Listen, though, but this is what I told Phone Jones, though. When I was talking about, I don't know if you heard the joint I was talking about that I did with Phone Jones with KRS1. Talking about how Twerk disrespect KRS1. Okay. Um, this is what I was saying. If you don't oh, know disrespect, nothing oh, about... Oh, disrespect the KRS1? Uh, twerk, New Jersey twerk. Oh, did he? Yeah, yeah. He he talked about mimicked his styles like yeah, whoever rap like this, yada yada. yada. But he he but he but he trashed KRS One and lift Pac up. But he did it to support his argument that Mook wasn't no fucking legend. You see what I'm saying? That's retarded. Yeah, yeah. But I I wanted to say something. I wanted to say something real quick. Pac ain't even in the same category when we're talking. But see, KRS One made it possible for motherfuckers like Pac to even exist. Right, but Pac wasn't even a lyricist, so he goes in a completely different bag. Pac was a poet. Right. But see, right. what I wanted to say was is that don't speak on shit that you know nothing about. I understand that these young niggas don't, uh, is not informed on what's going on and all they know is Pac and Lil Wayne and shit like that. Wait, hold on. One, but, one, let me say this one thing real quick. Go ahead, bro. That, the crazy thing about that is he's... he's he, had, he felt like he had to down KRS one in order to lift Pac. But when you talk to Pac, he has the utmost respect and gives the props to KRS one. Mm -hmm. So that's the same exact deal we're seeing here. The people that y'all talking about and trying to praise and lift up, they they were inspired by Cassidy. So what are you even talking about? Cassidy even went on his Instagram and was uh, you know, saying, man, don't disrespect uh KRS one because he seen my video and shit like that and what I did and he just was like, man, KRS one was like. Was like his his inspiration, his biggest inspiration. Right. People like KRS One, LL Cool J, shit like that, man. There is no Tupac without without Chris, man. Yeah. There's no there's no Tupac without him. So that's that's. And I know these young niggas, man. We want to give them the benefit of the doubt, but I ain't giving them the benefit of shit because don't speak on nothing that you don't know nothing about. You see what I'm saying? If you don't know nothing about what we got, we ain't no excuse. We have YouTube, we have technology. You could do research now. Right. Well, that's why I, uh, 
That's why I had to address Chess with his old ashtray Don Cheeto from Fresh Prince looking retarded haircut. Hey. I had to address him because he's talking about things that he doesn't know. And and not only does he not know them, he's not even qualified to even have that discussion if we being honest. Bro, you're not qualified to have no no greatest in battle rap or, or history of battle rap discussion, my man. You're not qualified to do that, bro. You ain't enough. You ain't enough. You haven't left a big enough imprint on the game. If we remove everything that Chess ever did, the game doesn't change at all. But not even that. Remove- this is the same young motherfucker that choked. This is the same motherfucker that, that have battle. nervous breakdowns, spit up, uh, drink every water battle. in between rounds and shit. Right, every battle. You're not qualified. If we can if we can delete your, your entire catalog from the books, if we can delete it and it's still dope and it doesn't have it, it doesn't make any type of change or impact, then you're not qualified to talk about it. Real now, talk. Apply that apply that same exact deal to the people that he was talking about, to a Cassidy. Delete, mm-hmm. uh, delete Cassidy's entire catalog from music to freestyles to battles. Delete his catalog. Does the game change? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. In, in fact, there are not a, not just battles that are going to disappear. There are going to be battle rappers that disappear because they were inspired by the group. Yeah, exactly. So Chess, Chess can't say that. But the, not, say not only that, that, not only that, they were inspired uh, by the, uh, as far as Cassidy, the dudes that were inspired by Cassidy are the ones that inspired Chess. Right. Like your arsenals, like your conceited. You see what I'm saying? Exactly. Yep. Like your Tay Rock. That's, that's what I was saying the other day, man. Tay Rock openly admitted. Tay Rock openly admitted that uh, he wouldn't be what he is without Cassidy. Right. And that's what I. That's that's the Bill Walsh uh, analogy I used the other day, man. Mm-hmm. Was Bill Walsh. He's the greatest offensive line because of the fact, not just because his system worked for him and he won championships with it. That's not all. Because there are a lot of offensive coordinators or offensive minds who won a Super Bowl or something. You look at guys like North Turner mm-hmm. or, or uh, Mike Holmgren. You look at those guys who had great offenses. However, the difference between them and, and Bill Walsh is there are people to this day in 2019 who are still using Bill Walsh's offense and winning championships with it. 40, 50 years after so Bill Walsh, I think Bill Walsh had the West Coast, right? Yeah, yeah, he's part of the West Coast. <laughs> hey, 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 Jersey. Yes, <laughs> Andy Reid. <laughs> Andy Reid, right. Exactly. You, see, you, see, you see Bill Walsh's fingerprint on all of these teams who run the West Coast offense or any variation of it. That's Bill Walsh. That's his mm-hmm. brainchild. So it's the same exact deal with Cassidy. Even the, the offensive coordinators right now who, who may be doing that, who maybe don't even know who Bill Walsh is, which is not... A lot of those, that's not the case, but I'm just saying hypothetically, even if they didn't know who Bill Walsh was, they're using his brainchild, and, and they're winning doing it, and they're being successful with it. Same thing with Cassidy. When he came with his style, nobody did it before him. Mm-hmm. And people, and, and it, Cassidy won with it. He won battles. He won, you know, musically. He won career-wise. He won with that. But not only did he win with it, other people who adopted his style and got it from him, they won with it. That's how potent it was. And there are, there are people right now to this very day, 10, 15, almost 20 years later, who are still winning with the formula that Cassidy came up with. Real talk. That's impact. That's impact. It can't be taken away from them. Even the people, like you said, who don't even know or understand that that's exactly what it is. Mm-hmm. They think they got it from somebody, but that somebody got it from somebody else. And that Real somebody talk. else that they, that they got it from got it from Cassidy. That's what I'm saying, man. So you can't erase his catalog without changing history. You can erase chess from existence and it does not change history at all. Hell you don't not. have that power, so you're not qualified to do that. These young motherfuckers, I tell you, boy. I tell yeah, you. Gas versus arts, man. And then having motherfuckers like Smack around don't make it no better. As a matter of fact, motherfuckers like Smack uh, made, is responsible for making motherfuckers like chess the way they are. That's a fact, man. He spoon fed Chess. He spoon fed him, yo. This was, I used it just like you. I, I used the WWF analogy once again. I'm not sure how old, you know, those of you who are listening are out there right now. But, you know, I just turned 36. So I remember the day when WWF, when I was a kid, 
WWF was still pretending like they were real, like they were real wrestling. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It wasn't until a few years after that where they finally admitted, okay, yeah, this is all staged and all that. But anyways, when I was a kid, when, when WWF would take the show on the road, they would go and tour cities. So what they would do is they would find amateur wrestlers from those cities or wrestlers who were trying to get on, and they would feature those guys. So those guys would, would have the opportunity to wrestle the, the WWF roster. So with, with, for instance, like The Undertaker, when I was young, when The Undertaker would wrestle and, and do a choke slam and beat you, pin you and all of that, what he would do is he would put you in, in that coffin, in his casket, they would drag you out of the ring and you never saw that person again. So, mm. so with, with, with battle rap, that's kind of that's kind of what it was in the beginning. If if you went out there and you battled somebody in the beginning of battle rap and you got killed, we didn't see you again. You yeah. went out of there. But with chess or, or, and, and choking, man, nah, that no. That they recycle. They recycle these niggas. Right, and that was that was worse than anything was choking. But but chess, he choked in more battles than he didn't choke. And he's still being booked for it. Now, and I'm not talking about these old little born legacies and all of that type of garbage. I'm talking about Jess is still being booked for decent events. Smack, mm-hmm. spoon fed him. He gave him opportunities that nobody else. But I told, but I was telling my people, people smack bred it. I was telling my people, smack bred it. Uh, strategically braided these young motherfuckers just so that he can keep recycling them. De- like I told you, motherfuckers like Cassidy, motherfuckers like uh, Mook. Lux, no, this is a hidden agenda out for these dudes. Even right. a motherfucker like Danny Myers, because they, they smacking them know that they're gonna ask for for their worth. You, you see what I'm saying? Give them anything, man. What you say? You just give, I said you can't just give them anything. Yeah. Smack knows that. So with the roster that smacks, so that's that's what I was saying about you know what Smack did that Summer Madness two card that was supposed to be ushering in the new and getting rid of the old. Because the dudes who were lit around that Summer Madness 2 time when you got your DNA, your Charlie Clips, you know, your, that that era, those were the guys in Battle Rap. They were the guys running Battle Rap. They were the top guns. But the people who were rocking with Battle Rap from the beginning, we were always asking about, yeah, well, you know, because that dude is dope. Your DNA is dope. Such and such is dope. But who, man, but Lux. And we started talking about the, the, the guys who, who were there from the beginning of the year, but they couldn't beat those guys. So Smack didn't want no part of them because those guys wanted to be paid. Mm-hmm. So with Summer Madness 2, it finally came to a head where Smack was on some, all right, well, look, man, this roster that we got now, these dudes, your Hitman, Hollis, your Birds, and all of them, they nice, but the, the people not rocking with them and calling them the greatest ever because of these original guys. So we got to get them out of here. So that's why he brought the OGs back on that card they were supposed to be sacrificed. They were supposed to die. It just didn't happen that way. So when 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 Smack brings those guys, and why did and, and bro, why didn't it happen that way? I want to see if we on the same page with this one. Because these the guys weren't good enough to beat them. Those guys were the originals. They had the original styles. They had the formula. They had everything that it we took. Talk. They just weren't good enough to beat them. A lot of those guys were clones of those guys. So when the originals came back, they died. So Smack and Beast. URL's plan was for those guys to, to die. And, and once we see the new guys kill the old guys, no longer can we go on these these videos and on these battles and start bringing up, oh, yeah, Lux. Lux would have killed him or, 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 or Luke would have did this because that's what was happening prior to that. But you so know what? Ain't that sad, though? But but Jersey, ain't that sad, though? That smack didn't grow on each other and, and the fact that we have to... Uh, Rely on the goat, or rely on the other veterans and shit like Mook and, and Lux to be like a verb or something, or arson. That's supposed right. to be that's supposed to be a t top Briz. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? Can't. They can't because that's the thing. They ain't earn they straight. They didn't earn. They didn't. They didn't earn what they right. position. So that's the point. But that's the irony here, Double Lord. That's the irony is the people who are pushing us back. You know the. the major bloggers and, you know, the battle rappers and the league owners and all, the people who are pushing us back, that's what they're fighting for. Mm-hmm. And, and what they're trying to tell us is, they're trying to tell us that battle rap evolved, battle rap got better, not worse. Battle rap got better, so y'all want to stop the progress of battle rap and blah, blah, blah. So what we're saying is, no, battle rap did not get better. Y'all are saying that, but you can't prove it, you can't show it, because these older guys 
are coming in and they wiping out these young dudes. They wiping them out. Yo, they mopping them. They killing them. So what do you mean it's getting better? And that's that's the reason why they're pushing and fighting back so much is because they finally got the game to a place where they can eat. And that goes from from snacking beasley. That goes to the battle rappers themselves because they couldn't eat nowhere else. They couldn't get deals and, or anything like that. And it's crazy right now is they don't even need deals. This ain't 1991. You can deals back then. Were, made, were mainly about publishing and were about distribution. There was no internet in the early 90s and all of that. There was no internet. So in order for you to be heard by consumers and whatnot, you had to put yourself in a position for with distribution, like for your music to be heard. But now they have the ability to get the product straight to the consumer and they still can't eat. They, can, they, don't, have, they, don't, need, uh, they don't need producers. They don't, need a, they don't need a label to push their stuff. They have their channels, they have their avenues, and they can push their stuff right now by themselves, not have to worry about royalties. They were really nice and wanted to get on. If they was really good at what they did, they would be eating right now, but they just can't. This is literally the only arena that 99% of these dudes can eat in. So this is why they're fighting us so, fighting us so hard, my bro, is because mm-hmm. when we succeed, and putting everything back in its proper perspective, what it's supposed to be. These dudes can't eat anymore because they're not good enough to do that. They can't come with, with just lyricism. You look at a hitman holler who's one of the most popular battle rappers ever. No bars. No but you bars know what though about him, man? You know what about him, man? What's the name brought to my attention, right? Uh Steph 30. I did a video. Shouts out to Steph 30 too. We did yeah, it. We did a video. Up. What'd you say, bro? Oh, nah, nah, I was just saying what's up to Steph 30. Oh, yeah, salute to Steph. But Steph 30 was just saying this yesterday, right? He was like, uh, you know, because, you know, uh, Charlie Clips and Goods is about to battle in Double Impact versus uh, Hitman Holler. John, John and Hitman, man. Oh, yeah. And, uh, what's the name? was like, uh, oh, he was telling me that Goods destroy Hitman. You see what I'm saying? He said Goods destroy Hitman. And I was just saying, how the fuck do Hitman... Is you know is expecting to get a battle with the goat and Cassidy just destroy goods. You see what I'm saying? Right. If goods destroy hit man, Cassidy destroy goods, and that's exactly what Cassidy is talking about. Y'all niggas want to battle me, but all y'all niggas do is lose. Right. Y'all well, lose to why, each other. That's why they're trying to go with the narrative that that goods beat Cassidy and he did. It wasn't yeah. even close. Like it's not even this. This should not. Even, we shouldn't even have had to make. A debate. Was breaking that battle down the way we did, man. It was a no-brainer. It wasn't even close. But Goods is Goods is dirt, yo. He trash. He's, he's dirt. He's trash. He's dirt. Now I, I want to take a wager. How many How many Cassidy bars or Cassidy references you think Clips and Goods will come up with? I think that everybody on that card is going to mention Cassidy. Right? Oh yeah, hell yeah. yeah. They gonna They gonna mention Cassidy moving forward. Period. In, in that battle, in, in, the, in the Charlie Clips and Goods. How many times do you think they're gonna mention Cassidy's name? She. We should we should least, we should do another video about that one. Yeah, I'm thinking at least once around, Goods gonna say something about Cassidy. Then Clips is gonna say because Clips already said something about Cass in his last battle. I forget who he was battling, but Yeah, I remember. Uh, I remember. Oh Matt, when he battled Matt, Matt Harper. Yeah. That shit was corny but, too. It was, man. It was. All these brothers is like they, they just they corny. So battle rap is progressively getting worse, and they're trying to say that it's getting better. But and did you see that watch. face off though? Nah, I'm yeah. not watching. Nah, I'm not. Man, interested. that shit look. Man, they laughing and hugging and like 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 I said yesterday, like they had a cookout or something. Uh, yeah, I'm not even interested in that, my bro. Shit, I'm that shit battle. corny. I'm not a fan of none of them. Clips is highly overrated to me. Hitman is highly, highly overrated. John John is John John is the dopest one out of all of them. Yeah, John John is. Yeah, and John John is a thief, so. <laughs> yeah, he is. John John is a thief. Now he, he does it in a clever way, I guess. But he, he just took it too far. Cause you know, for instance, like when when, when Cass battled disaster, right? You remember Cass did his disaster impersonation? Yeah. He did that for what? What was it? 12, 16 bars maybe in the first round and that's it. John John, when he, whoever he's battling, it's like all three rounds, 
he's, he's rapping in their style where he's taking bars that they said and he's trying to flip them back on them or whatever the case may be. So, I mean, it, it, it's dope, but he just does it too much. It, it, it's yeah. like, it's diluted. It's diluted, man. It's, it's turning into, it's technically, it's turning to uh, Stiller. Right. Right. Yep. But yeah, yeah so, so they tried to put a hit out on, on, the, on the OGs and it just didn't work for them. So, uh, you know, that, that messed the game up because of the fact that now it made it even worse. Now Lux is in demand and Mook is in demand. Those people are in demand. We want to see them again. And we already know what those brothers got paid for that.